Hello and welcome. Uh, I'm Greg McGarrell from Nupsala, and I'm joined today by Kay, the director and uh, inventor of the Equimed. Uh, we're going to be looking today at this uh, new product. It's reached us uh, here in the Nupsala pharmacy the last few months, and it's uh, activated carbon and silver dressing, which is a topic application for wound care. So Kay's going to take us through the product and give us a little bit of a tutorial on when, where, and how to use this product to get the best benefits out. So I'm really looking forward to this. Thank you, Kay, for giving up your time today and uh, look forward to hearing what you've got to say. Thank you. Hi, Greg. Um, yes, um, I started Equimed um, back in 2011. <clears throat> it was all a little bit of a pipe dream at the time. Um, a friend of mine um, who was a research scientist was working with activated carbon and silver wound dressings in the human um, wound dressing market. Um, I basically had a horse at the time that had a chronic, um, a chronic wound, open wound due to a passing term dermatitis and he basically could not get, um, get the wound closed and it just kept reinfecting really lymphangitis etc. Um, and we tried this wound dressing um, and <laughs> lo and behold um, it worked and within, within a week the horse was back out, the wound was dry and healed um, and that was the sort of light bulb moment when I thought well why have we never seen this before and why have I never heard of it before and we started doing research and case studies and how to make it into a viable product for, for vets to use but also the end user and the, the horse owner to use safely and easily and, and cost effectively um yeah i mean wounds on horses distal limb we we know are are always problematic whether it's a, a horse in the field or it's a a stabled horse um uh, the length of time it takes to heal uh, the cost consideration with daily changings of dressings um, we get into how to manage a wound whether it's a, an exudating wound or if it's a dry wound uh, infected versus non-infected they can be quite complicated and very frustrating for the owner aren't they so I think yeah. as we get a greater understanding on what is required to manage these wounds um, and what else there is out there to to help because um, not always is it possible to have a, a horse inpatient in a hospital we may be faced with a situation to do the best that we can whether it be because it's in a stable or even budget you know there could be a situation where people there's only so much they they can spend uh, just because of the the economic constraints they might be under so we've got to look for different solutions and i think that's the thing about wounds isn't it that not one thing is going to be i mean i know a lot of people will claim that they've got the best wound product but i think we've got to be flexible in where and what we can apply knowing what's out there i think that the real secret here is knowing what's available so you can apply it to both the owner and obviously the patient's needs that's exactly that's exactly what and, and like I say making it as simple as possible for the horse owner was something that was sort of really um, stuck in my mind and obviously the longer you've had horses the more time you, you have dealt with wounds or a passing dermatitis or whatever it may be but you know not everybody's as knowledgeable and, and to make things as as easy as possible um, but to still be very effective you yeah. know, it was our main criteria. Okay, just to clarify, because I think some people are going, pass and dermatitis, what, what was that? Um, good old terminology, I think we always know that, and I can refer to it. Um, that's effectively mud fever. That's what we're talking about in layman terms, but we're talking about um, essentially an infection of the dermis layer. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mud, mud fever has many names, doesn't it? Mud fever, yeah. mud rash, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Well, on this uh, case study here, um, it was a horse. This actually did end up um, going into a practice and staying because everything um, that the owner and the vet at the time had tried, which was uh, flamazine cream, steroid cream, bandaging, um, wasn't working. And obviously, if you if you look at the first picture, you can see the leg was really swollen. It was exudating. It was weeping. Um, so the horse ended up um, you know, actually being hospitalised. Um, <clears throat> as it happened, um, 
it was in our, our early days and I, I was working at the time with a, a vet called Alex Font up in Northumberland and he took on the case and um, used the dressing, um, the activated carbon dressing and basically you apply it to all of the affected area which is why we made it in a raw form as opposed to just a square dressing. Um, you cover the whole affected area and then um, bandage it in place um, whether it's with a vet wrap or whatever it may be um, and literally leave it on. Um, with this case initially as it's weeping we, we said change every two days um, uh, and then progress and try to leave it on for three days. What tends to happen especially with a case like this is the scabs then all go black, the leg scabs quite um, looks quite nasty this, but we don't advise um, you remove the scabs or scrub them or anything like that. Um, literally change the dressing, reapply it two or three days later and, and each dressing change you will see a difference. And obviously by the second picture, as you can see, um, the, the, the skin's pink, it's healthy, the scabs have all but gone and that was only in 14 days. And Kate, just to go back to the product um, for, for the viewers, it comes in these uh, sealed bags. It, it's on a roll. And I have to say, when I first saw this product, I was absolutely pleasantly surprised to see um, a dressing. This is a dressing um, on a roll form because um, my days in practice, we would, we would get these 10 by 10, you know, your, your menlin dressing that tends to be the, the standard size. And, and uh, somebody one day thought, oh, equine needs a... 20 by 10, um, that, that was a, a step in the right direction. But you, you spend most of your time either trying to get two dressings to stick together or you're trying to chop them up um, to actually get someone to, to come up with the idea of something that's on a roll that I can apply to the whole of the affected area. And I, I really take that point that you made is that we get to treat the whole affected area, especially a case like this, because we don't want an, an untreated area then to become the source of a continued infection. Um, so this, this material here, which is very easy to cut, I've cut it myself, it comes on the roll, and it does look like a piece of cloth, but this is where I'm sure you're going to, it's impregnated. So just to clarify, which, which side is the side that we, we, we actually apply to the affected area again? Is the black the, side. Black side, absolutely, so we put this side on. Absolutely. The black side to the horse, yeah, that's right, yeah. yeah. Okay. And um, you're saying that, um, I mean, this can absorb some exudate if it were to exudate and it, and it wouldn't stick or, I mean, we often find that things like menlin and stuff is good because we don't get where if we're going to change the, the dressing, um, that we don't want the dressing to, to kind of tear the, the scab off or it to become a painful uh, yeah. problem when we're going to change the dressing. So this can absorb, but we don't really have that static interference where it sticks to the dressing. Is that right? Yeah. What tends to happen, especially um, because the black side is against the horse, that is actually the activated carbon side. Okay. And because activated carbon, obviously, in its pure form, is very, um, uh, is very femur, as, you, as you're taking the dressing off, there's not a wound face layer to actually stick. Now, what, what tends to happen is the, the activated carbon will stay in the scab and then it allows the dressing to come off a lot easier. And there is no, um, it does no harm the fact that there is um, the, the activated carbon sort of still there because it's not, not actually in the skin, if that makes sense. But even Gosh. so, it's, com it's completely harmless, you know, um, to the wound, you know. So, to, so to... where you're saying the scabs become dark or black is actually because of the dressing that makes them go black, not that they've changed in. Yes, that, that's correct. Yes, it's because of the ac the, the, the activated carbon is sort of making up the scab if that makes sense got it. got it okay very ingenious good move forward okay again a similar um case but this horse obviously wasn't hospitalized um uh, uh, a chronic mud fever this was um if I, if I remember rightly it was um months and months and months with this horse as you can see it's severely um exudating the top the, the, the top pictures it was really, really weak. Then the, the leg was filled with lymphangitis. Um, no topical solution had worked in, in touching it at all. So again, um, it was the dressing we used um, on this case. And, and again, it was around about the 14 days. Um, 
sort of space of time when the condition um, was under control. Um, this one we swabbed um, and it was Dentophilus uh, congolensis bacteria um, as opposed to the last picture we showed was a much more aggressive bacteria which was the Staph A bacteria but, but even said um, this particular case was chronic it, it had gone on for months so we you know the, the owner was really um, extremely pleased we got it under control as quickly as we did and I think um, I've certainly been caught out by these sort of cases in the past where um, some horses can present almost fracture lame. I can remember a case came into uh, a hospital I was working at in Melton Mowbray where um, it, it literally was three legged coming in and it'd been referred and we thought that it, it was fractured um, until we realized that it was good old Muffy. These are incredibly painful and very uncomfortable for the horse, especially when they get to this stage. So, you know, getting into this and really getting on top of it is key. Yeah, it's um, one thing we have noticed, which obviously um, the horse can't tell us, but this case especially uh, was extreme. The horse was extremely lean and was in real pain. Didn't want to obviously be messed about with anymore and all the rest of it. And one thing we noticed um, with all of these cases is the horse becomes very manageable very quickly. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, going back to the manufacturer of the, of the actual activated carbon cloth itself, um, they've done studies in um, human um, wound care, obviously, um, and the patients do say the pain is very quickly um, under control. It, you know, it, it, the pain is one of the first things you see the horse becoming much more manageable and allowing you to change the dressing without you know, as we, as we all know, flying hooves and things like that when they get these sore cases. So um, that's a real plus point that it be, the horse becomes a lot more comfortable quickly. And I understand that we don't change this as often as daily. I mean, when we used to go back to the old, you know, SOP, our standing operating procedure of dealing with that type of case was to going through a, a fairly... Uh, painful and rigorous sort of cleansing phase of scrubbing them, getting into the scabs. They would often bleed quite a lot. Um, you know, the, the horse was always very apprehensive to be managed the following day or even days thereafter because they kind of knew what was coming. Um, I think I remember days of, you know, I would be wearing more of the, the hippie scrub in the bucket than was on the leg. Yeah. Uh, so anything we can do to try and get on top of these cases um, to minimise that, uh, that, that, that painful process or, or even the, the anxiety a horse might be going through because it's already in pain. It's a fairly painful topical condition to know what really might be around the corner as far as you're walking towards it every morning with the head collar and a bucket going, please, this really is not going to hurt. But yeah. um, hey, it might do a little bit. Yeah, uh-huh. That, um, that's in, in it's it's time and time again it's happened obviously we've been I, I've been working with this product a lot of years now so um, it is definitely um, a case that this um, does um, stop the, the horse being so uncomfortable but like you say um, initially like for a case as, as, as bad as this one particularly I would say change the dressing after two days um, but as as the condition becomes um, drier and drier and drier you know you can leave the dressing on anything from three to even five days providing the horses in a clean you know it's not turned out and things like that you know um, so and the less you the less you're touching it you know the more comfortable um, the horse is going to be yeah uh, that, that, that's that's great because like I said I mean we are SOP used to be almost daily cleansing so I think anything that we can do to help get over that and Every other day for me right now, I think, is, is, is a great notice. The next two case studies that you can see uh, in the next slides, the pictures, were both um, serious sort of wound um, wire injuries. Both horses had been through a wire fence. Um, uh, the bone was exposed on one and a severed uh, tendon. Um, and the second one, um, the tendon again was exposed. Um, with the first one, um, we trek that from day one. Um, my veterinary advisor, um, uh, Mr. Cedric Chan, um, he was actually on site when the, the horse came in. So he, straight away from day one, he debrided the, uh, um, debrided the area, tidied up the wound, um, obviously 
uh, as best as possible. And then literally from that day, it was dressed and it was changed every three days. Um, it was only needed to be surgically debride, um, I think, twice in four months. And it was literally from day one, it was four months to the day when the horse was um, back out. And um, if, you, if you look at the, the final picture, you can see with a very, very minimal scarring um, to, um, to what you would expect if you were constantly, you know, um, cutting back or thinking about skin grafting or, you know, it's, it's a much easier and faster and um, more cost effective um, treatment. Yeah, I think I think the speed um, is, is the vital uh, a key component here is, as we already alluded to in the previous uh, case study, is that um, the less we have to interfere with the, the wound, um, the better, both from uh, an ec economic point of view of, of dressing changes, materials used, um, topical materials, anything which is really going to uh, bring the, the economic factor of these injuries down. Um, because uh, we sometimes lose touch with exactly how much these cost. And then the second one is, is actual time as a patient is a, is a massive factor, um, especially with something like a, a, a laceration to a, you know, a distal limb, a tenderness area. Um, all too often they would be an impatient, especially during that critical phase. Um, so allowing the patient to be discharged sooner rather than later uh, is great both from, again, the economic standpoint, but also from wound healing, getting to the end result, and then obviously getting back to full recovery and, and on being the, the horse that you want it to be. Uh, so yeah. again, I'm really pleased to see some of the, the speedy recovery that this dressing has an impact on for conditions which we know are quite complicated. So Kay, did you have some pictures of that case if you want to flick forward? Yeah. Yeah. That, that's, wow, it there. That's, that's, that's a, that's a, that's an impatient case straight away. Well, well, <laughs> yeah. That's not going to get treated at home, is it? So, no, uh, definitely. So take us through the timeline on this again. It was um, from picture one to picture three was exactly four months. Um, wow. Obviously, the horse was an impatient for a little while um, until the, the, the wound had um, sort of stabilised enough for the owner to be able to effectively change the dressing herself. But that, okay. um, but that third picture is uh, four months exactly. Um, so and, and there was only, um, uh, like I say, I think there was only once or twice that there was any sort of um, proud flesh cut back. So it minimised the proud flesh massively. Um, I was going to say that. So that proud flesh is that granulation tissue, that hypergranulation tissue that that pushes through. And for any horse owner that's watching this, the the problem with proud flesh, as we, we uh, commonly term it, but it's granulation tissue that comes through, is that there's a, a margin, the epithelial margin, where your skin cells are growing. If we get a situation where the, the proud flesh is above that level, then our epithelial cells, our skin cells, can't go up and over. They kind of just stop. And that's a massive factor to uh, a, a wound of the distal limb in a horse, delayed healing, you know, um, certainly seen a lot of distal limb injuries go on for months and months and months and not close. Um, almost a sort of a, a pre uh, picture one and picture two there. They get stuck in that, that zone as such. Um, so to, to hear that it probably only needed debriding, and that was a surgical debriding by Cedric, was it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's really encouraging because all too often we have to try and attack that with chemical, you know, with either steroid or other more caustic agents to try and knock that tissue back. Um, and sometimes what we try to do with these wounds inadvertently speeds up that granulation. So we're always trying to play off, you know, trying to promote healing, but not promote the granulation yeah. and promote that epithelialization. Um, and I would have expected between picture number one and picture number two, quite a prolonged period of that battle between granulation and obviously um, it, it you know coming together yeah. um, so that was really encouraging to see yeah um, on this particular case here we didn't get it from day one um, uh, she'd again exactly like you say been um, advised by her vet to use um, steroid cream 
um, and it was it, it just wasn't looking nice it wasn't looking healthy so um, she, she um, did her own research actually and, and, and stumbled upon us um, and Cedric um, spoke to her vet and explained you know how things worked and whatnot so it was about uh, I think picture number one the horse had had for about three four weeks um, and obviously picture number two is um, 18 days after we um, you know she started using the dressing and she was and she was managing it herself at home the horse was back at home and, and she was changing every three four days it's clear to see picture one for um, non clinical people looking at these pictures um, I know it looks quite graphic and sometimes you don't like to see these pictures but what I'm going to draw your attention to is when we're looking at wounds we're always looking at the border the margin of the wound um, and how pale that looks and the poor pigmentation of that and the, the sort of the, the gray looking tissue that's always a really poor sign of healing um, and, and I would certainly be worried about the, the degree of healing that's going on in picture one and very encouraged to see the contrast in picture two see how vibrantly pink that is Kay I know this is exactly your area of expertise as well knowing what they should look like but <laughs> I'm encouraged by uh, the, the, the colour of the margin, the colour of the border and how healthy it looks and I mean there's a little bit of bleeding probably post um, removal of the dressing or cleaning up afterwards but sometimes again that's a little bit of a healthy sign because if we're getting a little bit of capillary bleeding then we're getting you know the ingrowth of those vessels which is all part of the healing process and um, if I wasn't getting healing I'd be worried that we're not getting the ingrowth of those new vessels uh, which are going to supply everything that tissue needs as far as nutrient goes yeah and i think um the final picture was again oh it was 60 days that was 60 days of using the dressing well, obviously you can see like you say the lovely healthy color but you obviously yeah. see how massively um uh, small the, the wound is as compared to what it started out at, at. um and again the scarring minimal scarring and I, and I would also make an assumption here, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, is normally these sort of wounds, if they're going to exudate 60 days later, we get a bit of scolding going on, you know, distal to that, that wound where you get that constant exudate dripping down or if it's captured, is that sometimes starts to have an effect on the surrounding healthy skin. I'm not seeing that at all in those pictures, which would indicate to me that this probably had minimal exudate, which means it really wasn't infected during the period of time that yeah. this person was applied, which was encouraging that healing. And, and what, what it, again, let's go back to the dressing now, Kay. So we talked about the carbon. What else is having that effect on, you know, trying to um, fight back the infection or, or bacterial contamination? <clears throat> um, well, basically, the dressing's impregnated with uh, microscopic nano silver, okay. um, and, it, and it's, uh, it's put into the cloth. Um, in the manufacturing process, the silver's heated up um, so high into so it turns into a vapor, and then the cloths then pass through, um, and obviously the vapor then sticks to the to the fibers of the activated carbon, making it an anti making the activated carbon um, antibacterial, um, and then it comes out. It's cooled very very quickly, which means that the silver um, stays in the dressing. So. Yep. I think one of the plus points of the dressing is it's completely non-invasive. It doesn't put, it doesn't leach silver into the wound like. Um, yeah, you're not like, putting like, silver oh, on it. You're not putting silver in it. No, no, everything's done inside of the cloth. So if there were bacteria in that particular wound, the activated carbon works like a little bit like a sponge. It sucks the bacteria into the cloth, and, and then the bacteria this, can't multiply. No, it can't multiply, and the bacteria. Um, obviously looking for a food source, engulf the silver, the microscopic nano silver, and obviously silver's um, antibacterial and kills the bacteria. Like, again, all in the cloth. Nothing goes back into the skin. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Oh, we've got a dog now. Okay. Yeah, this, this is the final one. Um, unfortunately, this dog, this was, this was cancer uh, mm. that the dog had. Um, but... It, the, the owner was just wanting something to make him more comfortable, um, you know, um, whilst he was going through his treatment because these lesions just wouldn't close up. Um, so as you can see, um, we, we give him the dressing. He, he started to use the dressing. He, he also had another sore on his front leg as well. 
it was a Rottweiler. Um, and a month later, as you can see, um, the actual lesion itself is all but closed up. Um, obviously, it doesn't cure cancer, but the, the, the effects, um, you know, it, it went somewhere to keeping the dog as comfortable as possible and drying up these lesions whilst he was um, going through his treatment. Yeah, okay. So, I mean, again, what we've got a situation here is um, an area of tissue and a patient that is somewhat compromised, um, that any infection would normally take hold a lot more quicker than, than normal. Um, and the amount of, you know, swelling associated with that, I'm, I'm quite pleased to, to see how even in such tough conditions, the dressing was able to have an effect, a positive effect on such a wound. And, and what a poor case to use it on. I really feel for these, these dogs that have such a debilitating disease, uh, yeah. but a good example to show even in tough environments, how it may help where one wouldn't want to perhaps use um, drug either, you know, systemically or topically uh, because of other treatments that the dog may be receiving at that time where you don't know if a systemic medication may interact or have a contraindication with the systemic treatment you're on. Um, so yeah, great example of how to use it to avoid that, that situation. Basically, just a little bit of um, sort of background as to why the dressing does what it does. Um, when the dressing's made, um, the activated carbon part of it has um, an electrostatic charge run across its surface. It's called van der Waal for forces. Um, it's basically um, named after um, the guy um, that actually invented it. Um, and what it does, it, it'll ch pull any charged particle into its structure, these van der Waal for forces. A little bit like I said to you earlier um, about it being antibacterial and, and non-invasive. Um, so because the, the um, activator carbon pulls um, the charged particle, i.e. any bacteria, whether it be positively or negatively charged, it still pulls the bacteria into the structure of the cloth. And the bacteria can't become um, sort of um, resistant to it like you could a drug because yeah. it, it works like the same way as metal and a magnet work. It can't just one day stop stop being drawn into the structure of the cloth. And again, um, like I mentioned before, the bacteria then has not, nothing to feed on, i.e. the skin or infection that it's causing, and then looks for a food source. And this is when the, the silver comes into play and kills the, the bacteria in the dressing. Um, again, so there's no sort of um, bacterial buildup in, in the skin. Um, and again, enhancing um, the wound environment to allow the skin to heal faster as it has no foreign bodies in there again the silver's not going into the skin um, like an ionic silver would do um, it, it all works outside um, of the skin inside the dressing okay now what about when <clears throat> we change the dressing any advice on what we topically clean it with if there's any chemical uh, such as chlorhexidine or something that one would want to use on to, to clean the wound? Do we dry it? I mean, what I, mean, what I don't want to do is, is, is end up having a soaked wound, which I put this on and, and this just sticks or it absorbs chlorhexidine. So, so what's your advice on, you know, cleaning or debriding a wound in between dressing changes? Um, when, you go to ch when you're changing the dressing, um, obviously if, if the wound's been exudating heavily, I would say just to to clean it with water, um, you know, maybe not towel dry if it's a, if it's a bad wound, um, maybe some cotton wool or something like that, just to take the, the initial excess water off it. Um, but no, um, no topical solutions or okay. heavy scrub or anything like that, um, because um, any chemicals that may be left on the skin, because going back to this um, activated carbon drawing charged particles, Chemicals are also charged particles, so it will saturate the dressing and stop its, its action, um, its antibacterial action working so well. So basically, you don't want to be cleaning um, or using um, creams or any other topical lotions in between dressing changes. You literally just want to have it look as nice and dry as possible and then put the next, the next dressing on. So if there was no exudate, would you be advising not to lavage the wound? Don't, don't wash it, just change the dressing? 
Uh, yes. So that you, you've effectively um, just, you've used up the healthy components. They, so essentially my dressing now is, is uh, um, uh, absorbed all the, the, the bacterium as such because it's a bit of a bacteria magnet. We've got carbon that's been deposited onto the surface. So all I want to do is remove that and apply fresh so it can carry on going. So not a, not a vigorous lavage or anything, but if we needed to clean a little bit of extra day, then one would just do gentle lavage and perhaps just a pat dry with a sterile towel or something, nothing more vigorous than that. Yeah, that's exactly. Um, if there's no extra day, like you say, exactly right, Greg, just put the dressing, the clean dressing straight back on. Yeah, fantastic. And really, when you're cutting this, again, I go back to one of the points I love about this dressing because it's on a roll, is all I need to do is just sort of measure and then just cut that amount. So as, as it obviously decreases in size, I would end up using less and less of this, which is quite attractive. That's correct, yeah. Exactly. Okay. Good. Any further points, Kay, on the dressing? Oh, we've got some more points. Let's go for that. Um, it's um, the points of the dressing, basically, just going back to what we spoke about. It's 100% antibacterial. Um, it also adsorbs wound odour, which with a normal mel melanin dressing, if you do have um, quite a, um, infected, w whether it be wound or mud fever or whatever, can sometimes be quite smelly. This also absorbs the, w adsorbs the wound odour. Um, uh, it, like we've talked about, it enhances the wound heal rates and minimises the granulation tissue. Um, we've also noticed as well um, a little bit more towards the stable boot side of it where it's horse owners um, that it does go somewhere to keeping the swelling um, of the leg right down. Um, it tends yeah, we'll to do, help. Yeah, it would do if you're decreasing the bacterial um, content burden of the, the area yeah. in the wound. Yeah, I can see how that would have a uh, anti-swelling um, uh, effect because it's, it's you know, got that, that association with removing what would cause the swelling in the first place. Mm -hmm. And because it's not invasive, I think one of the, especially if it's a horse owner and maybe not um, so experienced, to worry about overusing it, like maybe like a, um, you would with a, um, like an animal index sort of thing, you can overuse it, you can use it too much. With this, because it's non-invasive, you can't overuse it it doesn't do anything to healthy skin so you know if you were putting too much on or you were covering covering more of the area than where the just the wound um was it it, it makes um you know it does nothing to healthy skin so you can't overuse it yeah now talking about healthy skin you brought out <clears throat> this boot i'm just gonna reach it here so bring it more into view um talk to me a little bit more about this Kay, and, and why you've developed that and and what that differs to the, uh, the, the dressing that we know, which we'd be using in, in practice in the hospital or even as an owner being discharged with perhaps a role or so of this to, to do your, your changes as instructed. But here we've got a boot. Take me through this. This is a bit different. Yeah, um, basically the boot, um, I made it, um, we, we designed it just for ease of application. But also, you know, if you have a case of mud fever or a, a wound where you wouldn't necessarily call a vet in, a horse owner themselves, it works um, this, exactly the same way as the dressing purely because inside of that boot is laminated um, the activated carbon and silver cloth. You yeah. can't see it because it's sort of sandwiched between the outer and inner material. Okay. I'm just going to take it off so you can have a look. Um, it's a fairly simple boot to apply, sort of thing that one would see on um, any type of Velcro boot uh, that would fly around the distal limb. Is this machine washable? It is, yes. Um, okay. The only stipulation we make is um, you can't use a conventional detergent um, because of the, uh, of the chemical components in the conventional detergent. All you would use would be basic washing soda. Um, just from the supermarket because it is just pure soap. It doesn't have the chemical chemical components that say your average person or DAS or whatever it may be have in. But they are machine washable at thirty degrees. Um, okay. So if you were, go ahead. Sorry. Um, I was going to say if it was um, washed incorrectly, that that would saturate the cloth with chemical and it would then not be able to. You know, um, absorb the, the um, bacteria into the boot. 
Okay, so um, the point that I was going to make is um, we would typically use this on um, a, a fairly mild to superficial wounds, uh, rubs, uh, perhaps even a little cut that one might have noticed, you know, after hunting or after eventing. Um, yeah. So rather than again reaching for your creams or lotions and potions that may turn into something else because you've over vigorously tried to clean it or, or uh, uh, deal with it, is that one would just, like we say, clean it up and then apply this perhaps overnight or during the day uh, for the next few days just to get on top of it so it doesn't then become a problem um, with, like we said, you know, over, over cleaning it or over managing it as such. Uh, I, I quite like this. And do they come in different sizes? They do, yes. They're, they're small, medium and large, front and hind um, sizes, extra large. Um, not that we've, we've made them very often, but we have had special order for like an extra large, like a shire type of horse. Sure. Um, but, but, um, do they come as a single or is it a pair? It's a pair. Okay. Very good. Very nice. Okay, is that okay? We've covered quite a lot on that one, um, and this is, like I said, it's the uh, the Equimed um, silver dressing, whether it's on the roll or it's uh, in the boot, uh, available from the pharmacy or uh, Equine Veterinary Clinics that stock it. Um, so, Kay, any further points to make or not? Are we done? Um, I, th I, think, I think we've probably covered everything that it does, Greg. Yeah. Um, Again, thank you for your time and explaining your product. I think it's a, a fantastic addition to what we have here at Luxar. And I think it's one of these things that I think horse owners should have as a, a sort of a backup um, in sort of your first aid kits, knowing that you could pop this on wherever you are to deal with any superficial wounds. And again, when it gets to the, the mud fever season, um, I know we're kind of coming out of it with the spring, but I do see a little bit of mud fever still lurking around. I don't think we're out of the wet season yet. Um, but any surface wound that one would like to uh, manage, whether it be in practice with the equine surgeons who may be looking at this, or even small animal surgeons looking at different ways of managing those, those superficial or surface wounds, um, I think it's a fantastic product on a roll and will decrease the amount of topical um, uh, product that one might use or even systemic medication, and especially those conditions where systemic medication may not be appropriate and something like this may be appropriate in managing a potentially infected wound. Um, so thank you very much, Kay, for your time. I look forward to speaking to you again or reviewing some other case studies with you. And uh, thank you very much for watching. Thank you.